If you want to be a pilot, one of the requirements is that you know what documents that are required to be on board the aircraft when you go fly. Now, there are actually quite a few more than you might think, but don't worry, it's not too hard, and I'm going to explain everything you need to know in this video right here. Welcome to Free Pilot Training. I'm Josh. I've got a really important lesson for you today. You have to know this stuff if you want to earn those pilot wings, so let's dive right in. This lesson is the first episode in our discussion on the Federal Aviation Regulations. And as we're going through today's lesson, you're going to notice that when I talk about some of the requirements, I'm going to throw a reference like this on the screen. I highly recommend that you look these up in your personal copy of the FAR AIM, and it would be a good idea to bookmark them as well. That way, if you forget something from today's lesson, you can just look it up really easily if you need to do that on your check ride. To get started today, I want to take a quick look at the three documents that a pilot needs to have in their possession when they fly an aircraft, or when they act as a required crew member. You'll find the details of this requirement in FAR 61.3, but if you want to do one of these things, you'll need to have these three items. First, you got to have your pilot certificate. This is basically your driver's license of the sky now. Then you have to have a valid photo ID. And I know this sounds kind of stupid since you would think that your PPL would count, but they don't put a picture on there because it doesn't ever expire. And if you don't ever get any more ratings or certificates, you're stuck with that card. Anyway, what constitutes a valid photo ID? Well, it can be any of these things right here. First, you could use a state-issued driver's license. And if you're unfortunate enough to live in Washington, D.C. or one of the U.S. territories, your driver's license counts as well. A government ID card is fine too, and that can be a federal or state issued ID card. Then for my military brothers out there, your military ID card or CAT card works fine as well. You can also use your passport if you want to lug that thing around everywhere you go. But if you don't want to do that, another thing that works is an airport security ID card, as long as it gives you unescorted access to security identification display areas, whatever that means. But wait, there's more! You can also use any other form of identification that the administrator finds acceptable. And who in the world knows what that means? But I'm guessing that if you don't have any of these other forms of identification, you can just call the FAA administration offices and ask them if what you have is okay. Yeah, I was wondering if I could use my Costco card as a valid ID. Well, why not? It's got my picture on it. Last but not least, you have to have a current medical certificate. And it also needs to be the right type of medical certificate for the type of flying that you're going to be doing. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a minute. But for now, just know that you have to have a current medical. In fact, if you're just starting to work on your private pilot certificate, you're going to need to get that medical certificate before you can fly solo. So I recommend knocking that out as soon as possible. The only time you don't need a medical certificate is if you're operating under basic med or if you're a sport pilot. I'll go into a little bit more detail on basic med in a future episode. There's quite a bit to know about that. But if you're not operating under basic med and you're not a sport pilot, you have to have all three of these things in your possession or they need to be readily available in the aircraft. If you leave it in your mom's basement, that's not going to work when somebody asks for your credentials. And that brings up a good point. Who can ask me for these papers? What are they going to do, pull me over up there? I can't tell you how many times I've heard that and that's about the dumbest thing to come out of someone's mouth because there's a lot of people that can ask you for these documents and if you don't produce them when they ask for them, it can get you in a lot of trouble. Here's a list of all the people that can ask you for these documents. In addition to the FAA, you could get asked for this by the NTSB, federal, state, and local law enforcement, and an authorized representative of the Transportation Security Administration. All these guys have the right to ask for your stuff. Don't think it just has to be the FAA. It doesn't. I'll be honest. I'll show my license to anyone who asks for it because that's another opportunity to tell someone I'm a pilot. And you know I'm not going to pass that up. All right, let's go a little more into the weeds on these medical certificates because you need to make sure that you have the right type. And you also need to make sure that it's not expired. With that in mind, it's a little more complicated than you might think. Here are the four types of medical certificates available. And you'll find the details on all this stuff in FAR 61.23, but I'll give you the basic scoop here. Okay, so the main difference in all these certificates is the type of exam that the doctor has to perform and how long the certificate lasts. In order to get your private pilot's license, you're going to need a third class medical certificate. First and second class medicals are really for commercial pilots, 
and there is a little bit more to the exam, but you only need your third class if you're going for your PPL. Then once again, there's basic med. But in order to earn your private pilot's license, you have to pass any one of these other three before you can use basic med. And then there's some limitations if you do decide to use it. Now, even though you're probably only going for your third class medical, let's talk about these other two really quick because you might decide that you want to make flying a career. First class medical exams are mainly for airline transport pilots who want to operate as the pilot in command. In other words, this would be the captain of an airliner. These guys need a first class medical certificate. Now these certificates don't last very long because the FAA wants them to get looked at by a doctor a lot more regularly than someone like you who's flying a Cessna 172 30 miles to get a $100 hamburger. For pilots under the age of 40, these things only last 12 calendar months. And if you're 40 and over, they only last 6 months. Now an important thing to keep in mind about these things is that when they expire, they aren't completely worthless anymore. For pilots with a first class medical 40 and older, when their first class expires, it turns into a second class for six more months, then drops to a third class. If you're below 40, when the 12 months are up, it automatically turns into a third class medical certificate. So you can still fly, you just can't do certain things. Now notice how this says calendar months. That just means that it expires the last day of the month, 12 months from this date. In other words, if I got my first class medical on January 15th of last year, my first class is going to expire on January 31st of next year. Then, like we said, it's not completely expired at that point, now it's just a third class medical. You're going to see that a lot of dates in aviation are calendar months, so this is something you want to be familiar with. Next we have the second class medical certificate. Basically this is what you need for most other commercial flying jobs out there. And this one only lasts 12 months as well, no matter what age you are. Then once it expires, it reverts to a third class medical certificate. And this is something good to keep in mind, because if you're interested in aviation as a career, you might consider going ahead and getting a second class medical right off the bat to make sure you can pass that exam. It's nice to know that you can pass without any issues before you spend thousands of dollars on training. They don't typically cost much more and they always revert to a third class when they expire. And oddly enough, if you want to be a flight instructor before you go to the airlines or some other kind of commercial job, you only need a third class medical to be an instructor. So if you don't have aspirations of going to the airlines or any other type of commercial stuff, but you want to be an instructor, you only have to have your third class medical. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the third class medical, because you need to have this one before you can go fly solo and to operate legally after you get your PPL. Now the main thing you need to know about these third class medical certificates is how long they last before they expire. And that depends completely on your age. If you're less than 40, your third class medical lasts 60 calendar months. And if you're bad at math, that's 5 years. If you're 40 years old and older, your third class only lasts 24 calendar months or 2 years. And remember, those are calendar months, so it expires the last day of that month. So if you're less than 40 years old, you're good for 5 years. And if you're 40 and older, you only have two years before you have to get your certificate renewed. Really quickly, let's look at how they might ask you a question about this on the written exam. You could even get asked about it on your check ride as well. Let's say you have a first class medical certificate that was issued on November 11th and you're 20 years old. When does that thing expire? Well, a first class medical lasts 12 months if you're below 40. So this one expires next year on the 30th of November. Then it would revert to a third class. What if I was 55 years old and I had a second class medical certificate that was issued on May 14th? When would that one expire? Well, everyone expires at 12 calendar months with the second class. So that one would expire May 31st of next year. All right, here's kind of a tricky one. Let's say I'm 39 years old and I got my third class medical issued on July 4th. When does that one expire? Well, I'm below 40, so it would expire July 31st, five years from now. So the important thing to remember is that when these things expire depends completely on your age. And there's actually a handy little chart in FAR 6123. That works really well as a quick reference if you ever need a quick reminder. When it comes to these medical certificates, it's important to know that those exams have to be done by specific doctors designated by the FAA. These doctors are called Aviation Medical Examiners or AMEs. And you can find a list of all the AMEs on the FAA's website. All right, here we are on FAA.gov. I'll just move down here to Pilots and Airmen, then click on Medical Certification. 
Then I'll click this button that says locate an AME. Then we can just click this link that says search for an aviation medical examiner in your area. Now you can look at all the AMEs in your area. And if you're like me, you'll just choose a random name because who knows if they're actually a good doctor or not. I mean, if the FAA says they are, it must be true, right? Okay, so we've talked about the three things you need to have in your possession when you go fly an aircraft. But let's take a closer look at your pilot certificate because there are certain things on the back of it that this thing needs to say in order to fly certain aircraft. To make this easier to understand, let's take a quick step back and talk about a few things. In order to understand what you can and can't fly, you need to understand how we group the different kinds of aircraft. And the way we do that is by category and class. When I'm talking about aircraft, I'm basically talking about anything that flies and can hold a person. Yeah, I know a drone is an aircraft, but it's an unmanned aircraft, and they fall into a separate group. Maybe we'll discuss those on another day. Anyway, the FAA says there are basically seven main categories you can get certified to fly. For most of you here, you're going to get your private pilot's license to fly a powered, fixed-wing aircraft, and that's what we call an airplane, in case you didn't know that. Then, if you want to go fly a helicopter or gyroplane, you would need to have a rotorcraft category on the back of your license. A glider is another type of fixed-wing aircraft, but this one doesn't have an engine. Then, if you wanted to fly a balloon, you'd need your license to show this lighter-than-air category on the back. Next, we have the weight shift control aircraft. A hang glider falls in this category. Then we have the powered parachute. Then last but not least we have the powered lift category, which would be an Osprey or Harrier or something like that. I doubt anyone here is trying to get that category rating, but you never know. Anyway, the big thing to know about this is that once you get your private pilot certificate, you can only fly an aircraft in the same category that you are rated for. For example, if my license says airplane on the back, I can't just go jump into a rotorcraft without getting some training from an instructor and taking a check ride. Then from here, each category is further divided into separate classes. For example, in the airplane category, we've got four main classes you can get your certification on. These classes include single engine land, single engine C, multi engine land, and multi engine C. Now these classes exist for a reason. The way you land a single engine land airplane is significantly different than how you land a multi engine C airplane. So much so that the FAA has decided that you need to get specific training for these different types of airplanes and take a check ride. So, if your license doesn't have a certain category or a specific class of aircraft on it, you can't just jump in and take off. Now for you helicopter nerds out there, you basically have two classes of rotorcraft. You've got the helicopter and the gyroplane. So if you've got your helicopter license, you're going to have to get some training before you can just jump into a gyroplane. I don't know why anyone would want all those moving parts directly over their head anyways, but to each his own, I guess. Okay, so we've got the main group of flying thingies called aircraft. Then below that, we've got seven main categories. Then those are further divided into classes. Then we can divide these up even more into types. And these are basically the exact make and model of your aircraft. An example would be a Cessna 172 or a Piper Cherokee 140 or a de Havilland DHC-2 Beaver. And with that in mind, there are actually certain types of aircraft that you need a special rating to fly. These are called type ratings. Basically, if the airplane has a max gross takeoff weight of more than 12,500 pounds, or it has turbojet engines on it, you have to get special training and take a check ride before you can fly it. However, even though you have to have a type rating if the airplane has a turbojet on it, you don't have to have one if it's a turboprop airplane. The only exception to this is if the airplane is over 12,500 pounds, then in that case, you gotta have a type rating like this one right here. According to this guy's certificate, he's type rated to fly the Beechcraft 400. All right, so we've talked about all the paperwork you need to have on board the aircraft for you as the pilot. Now let's take a look at all the paperwork you need for the aircraft itself. Before we do though, I wanna take a minute to talk about the different categories of aircraft. And I know this might seem a little confusing since we just talked about aircraft categories, but those categories were for the purpose of a pilot certification. These categories are specifically referring to how an aircraft is certified, and they categorize airplanes based on how they're going to be used. You can also call these operating categories. When it comes to aircraft certification categories, there are five standard kinds, but you really only need to be familiar with three of them as a private pilot. These are normal, utility, and acrobatic. Right about now, you're probably thinking this sounds kind of familiar. And you'd be right because we talked a little bit about the normal and utility categories in my video on weight and balance. 
but the one we didn't discuss was the acrobatic category. Anyway, when an aircraft is certified, it has to meet certain criteria before it can be certified in one of these categories. For example, the normal category allows the aircraft to be used for normal everyday flying. It has to be able to do certain things in order to be certified in that category. For an aircraft to be certified in the utility category, it has to meet a few more requirements because this category allows you to do some additional maneuvers that the normal category doesn't allow. For example, this Cessna 172 Sierra is certified in the utility category, so I could do spins if I wanted as long as I stayed inside the weight and CG limits for the utility category. Acrobatic aircraft, on the other hand, are specifically made for aerobatics, so these have to be even tougher and meet even more rigorous criteria. But as long as it meets these specifications and the FAA has full faith that the wings aren't going to break off when you do a barrel roll, that's when it can get certified as an acrobatic aircraft. Okay, before we move on, let's take a look at a few more categories. These are special airworthiness certification categories, and you should at least have a general understanding of what a couple of these are. The experimental category is an important one for you to remember because this is the category that home-built aircraft fall under. Now the big gotcha with these is that there are quite a few restrictions when it comes to experimental aircraft. For example, you can't carry people or stuff for hire, and you also can't operate them on congested airways or over densely populated areas. I could go all day long, but you'll find a complete list in FAR 91-319. If you're hoping to maybe build your own airplane someday like I am, You'll want to write that down for future reference. Next we have the light sport. These are basically sport aircraft that don't really fit into the home built, ultralight, or gyroplane category. Aircraft in the restricted category are aircraft that aren't typically allowed to fly over densely populated areas. These are typically crop dusters and fire support aircraft. And the reason these are called restricted is because they're basically restricted on where they can fly. Now as you saw, there were a couple more, but those aren't really important for you right now. So let's move on and talk about the aircraft documents you need to have on board the aircraft. Now I want to reiterate that all these documents we're about to discuss need to be in the airplane. They can't just be in the hangar where you keep the plane. And to remember all these documents, I like to use the acronym AERO. For these first two items, you'll find the requirements for these in FAR 91203. Now as you can see here, the A in AERO stands for Airworthiness Certificate. Well, what the heck is an Airworthiness Certificate? Basically, this just tells the world that you didn't just weld a bunch of crap together and make something that's going to fall out of the sky on us when it breaks apart. This document basically says that the FAA approves the design of this aircraft and it's certified in these categories over here. And as you can see, this airplane is certified in the normal and utility category. It's not certified in the acrobatic category, so aerobatics are out of the question because it'll probably break in half if you try to do an Immelman or some other crazy maneuver. Anyway, one other thing I want to mention about this airworthiness certificate is that it doesn't have an expiration date. Now, just because the airplane has an airworthiness certificate, that also doesn't make it airworthy. If you start making illegal changes to the airplane or don't maintain it the way it's legally required to be maintained, it's no longer airworthy. But that's a lesson for another day. Anyway, next we have the registration. This is just like the registration of a car. You buy an airplane and you get it registered. And that just tells the FAA and everyone else out there who owns the aircraft. That way if you do something stupid, anyone can look up your end number and tattle on you. And there are some good things about this as well. If you were to crash your plane or something and they knew the tail number, they could at least have a starting point on who to contact. Okay, so the registration on the aircraft does expire and it lasts 36 calendar months or 3 years after the previous expiration date. So if the previous registration expired in November, the next registration will expire on the last day of November as well, 36 months from then. For the next R in our AERO acronym, that doesn't really apply here in the US, but if you're overseas somewhere, you typically need a radio operator's license. The O in our AERO acronym stands for operating limits, and you'll find this requirement in FAR 91.9. .9. As you can see here, we must comply with the operating limits of our aircraft. And there are two things that we need to have in the aircraft with us to help us do that. First, there must be a current and approved airplane or rotorcraft flight manual on board, if there was one made for the aircraft. I like to call this the POH or Pilot's Operating Handbook. If there wasn't a POH made for your aircraft, there has to be some kind of approved manual or placards or a combination of the two. Okay, one other thing I want to mention is that if you do fly an experimental or light sport aircraft, 
sometimes you'll find those operating limits attached to the airworthiness certificate. And a lot of times you'll find a lot more details in there about what you can and can't do in those aircraft. Last but not least, we have our weight and balance. Now technically this falls under the operating limits. So there isn't an actual regulation that specifically mentions the words weight and balance, but the FAA has made it clear in other publications that the weight and balance is required when you're talking about those operating limits. I went into a lot more detail on this in my video on weight and balance. So if you haven't watched that video, be sure to check that one out. Hey, thanks for joining me today on free pilot training. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider checking out my online store where you'll find all kinds of cool pilot gear. It really helps make it possible for me to make videos just like this. And it also lets your friends know that you're a pilot. You know they need another reminder. In my next video, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on basic med. And it's going to be a good one, so you don't want to miss that. When it's finished, I'll put it right here. If you just want to watch some more flying videos, check this one out right here. You're going to like it. See ya! Roach, you're not going to believe this. I just bought it free pilot training. I'm going to keep on watching.